Uh, so you are in a bio nano summer institute. What is bio nano? Who can tell me? <laughs> You've been here for almost two weeks. You should know by now. Bio nano. <laughs> What's the difference between bio nano and nano bio? That's a killer question. I've been wondering that a lot. Huh? I've been thinking about it. <laughs> it's an important question. Because at some level, some people in here are working on biological systems and nanoscales, and some people are working on nanoscale systems that so, biology. All right. Uh, so I think bio nano is uh, biological nanotechnology. Whereas nanobio is nanotechnology for bio applications. Okay? Sometimes the difference is very uh, small. So in this case, yeah, I'd say it's both bio nano and nanobio. So I'm going to tell you about uh, work uh, in my group that we've done on DNA sequencing using nanopores. So uh, let me begin. I actually don't know what kind of backgrounds you have. How many of you are have biology background? Just some of you. And who knows the difference between DNA and a protein? Oh, just two people. <laughs> wow. Uh, not bad. So, okay, DNA is a polymer, uh, and it's the most important, one of the most important molecules of life. So people often say that the most important molecule of life is oxygen, yeah, but that's not true, because there are quite a few organisms that can live without oxygen. So then the next one is uh, water, yeah. So yeah, without water, kind of difficult to live. So that's probably true. And after water, I guess DNA comes next, because DNA is in the center of any living creature that we know of. Or, well, if you talk about viruses, it would be some form of it, maybe RNA. So DNA is a molecule that carries uh, instructions for making, uh, mm, for example, us. Yeah? It's a fairly long molecule. It's made of uh, nucleotides. So nucleotides are those repeat units, which is shown here. Uh, and uh, altogether, each cell carries about uh, six billion, billions of those. Yeah? that's a human cell. So one nucleotide uh, is made of three parts. You have uh, the actual base, the one that is called, you know, ACGT, the sugar piece, and uh, the phosphate group. So what you need to know about DNA to understand the rest of my talk is that this phosphate group is negatively charged. So imagine it's like an electron. Actually, it has a charge of one electron exactly. Sugar is the same in all DNA molecules. And the base can be different depending on the sequence, right? So all of the sequence informations come from here. So if you ask me what's, what's, what is RNA, so RNA just has one atom here. Uh, extra yeah so it's just a small difference just one atom and it makes whole difference for how uh, our enzymes recognize and process the polymers so DNA comes in two form typically uh, that's something that we're all familiar with double-stranded DNA you know double helix featured in every good sci-fi movie and single strand DNA uh, not so popular uh, but it's just made by boiling uh, double-stranded DNA. So double-stranded DNA comes apart. It's not covalently bound to each other. It's just the soft bonds between two strands. Single-stranded DNA is much more flexible than double-stranded DNA. So basically, uh, if you let it be, it will curl into, into a coil. Like that piece of DNA would, would uh, form a coil of a size of that fragment. So it's compact. But double-stranded DNA is fairly rigid. So, an uh, important point that I'm trying to make here is that the sequence of the DNA is written in atoms. Yeah? And that's kind of really an uh, important point to take home. You know, we store information in all kinds of forms, right? So, you might still remember CDs, right? So, those were amazing shiny disks 
with uh, lots of information, but they are nothing in comparison to DNA, right? So now if you look at the hard drive still, you, uh, yeah, I don't know actually what the size of a pixel is, but probably 20 nanometers in a hard drive. And uh, for DNA, it's really just uh, a few atoms. So you're looking at zoom in of a double strand DNA. So C pairs with G and T pairs with A. And the pairing is uh, realized by hydrogen bonds that are shown here sch schematically by those dashed, air, uh, dashed lines. But, you know, if you take a few atoms and you move from A to, say, G, you'll get a G and, and, and so forth. So the difference is really small. Now imagine, I, mean, I presume many of you are engineers, imagine you want to build a device that would read the sequence of DNA. Yeah? How would you do it? You would have to look at a very small differences in the molecules, just a few atoms at a time, at room temperature. And by the way, DNA uh, usually is in water, so it's an aqueous environment. So it's a very messy system. So for example, if you want to use an electron microscope, right, and people have done it, you can in principle do it. You can take a DNA molecule, stretch it on a substrate, and zoom in. Usually you destroy DNA as you do it, but in principle it's possible. If you have a really high-end microscope, you can actually see individual uh, atoms and identify DNA sequencing, biophysical method. But that's, um, you know, that's not a commercial technology. No one will ever use it. Well, I'll take ever back, but no one will use it anytime soon. Uh, but uh, what uh, my group has been trying to do in collaboration with many experimental groups around the world, we're trying to develop a physical way to read out the DNA sequence, right? So that's kind of all what my talk will be about. Yeah, are there any questions so far? I actually appreciate it if you ask me a question as I go along because I have 70 slides and I will show you all if you don't interrupt me. All right, so um, here's the cost of DNA sequencing as it evolved with time. So some people say that DNA sequencing is the most rapidly developing technology ever since the beginning of the civilization in terms of how much money it costs to do the same thing. Yeah. You probably are familiar with the human genome project that uh, took 10 years to complete and many, many billions of dollars. And at the end of the day, they uh, obtain a draft of a human genome, which until now still remains a draft, because there are some parts of human genome that cannot be read using conventional technology. So, uh, yeah, so it used to be uh, the cost of sequencing $10 per base. Yeah, it's not even on the scale. It, oops, it was uh, in actually 90s. It was ten dollars per base, so three billion uh, bases. You do the math, thirty billion dollars per genome. It's kind of extreme. And um, since the beginning of the Human Genome Project, uh, the cost of DNA sequencing was falling uh, exponentially. And it had to do with uh, advances in microfluidics technology. So basically we had a method for DNA sequencing called Sanger's method. If you're interested, I can explain to you what that is. But in a few sentences, basically we take an enzyme, a biological enzyme that evolved through three billion years of evolution to recognize different uh, nucleotides and then we trick it to read out the sequence for us. So the Sanger's method is not a physical method of sequencing DNA. Sanger's method is tricking biology to read out the sequence for us. Okay? But it works. And um, all the advances in DNA sequencing technology were associated with uh, miniaturizing, uh, optimizing the Sanger's method. So at 2001, we were already uh, at 100 million dollars per human genome, which is still a lot, but again, a factor of 100 reduction uh, from previous costs. And then it was just following basically the Morse law. So if you look the Morse law curve, uh, it was following it. So it was dropping exponentially, but that was not fast enough. Because if you project this curve to uh, $1,000, which is kind of an important mark, then you would wait until 2040. Yeah, that 
and that was too long for, for us to wait. So NIH launched an initiative called Revolutionary Genome Technologies mm -hmm. about this time in 2004. And the goal of the program was to reduce uh, cost of genome sequencing to $100,000 by 2008 and to $1,000 by 2013. And that sounded in, like incredibly impossible at that time. Because basically what they were asking is to go super exponential in reduction of the cost. But surprisingly, it actually went just as predicted. So we've got a few disruptive technologies, so-called second generation sequencing on the market that brought the cost of sequencing to 100K. And we are somewhere here. So thousand dollar genome was claimed by Illumina at the beginning of 2014, so one month after the NIH deadline, but it's okay, I think. And uh, but you know, one thousand dollars. It depends how you count. If it's raw uh, reagents or cost of machine amortization over five years, heavy used, I think that's how you get this number. But then there's also questions about genome coverage, quality, and so forth. So I actually don't think we are at a thousand dollar genome mark, but it's about five thousand now. So. Uh, it's also time consuming. It takes quite a long of time to do the sequencing. It's not uh, a procedure that you would do uh, uh, when you like a blood test. Yeah, so it takes weeks. So we want to actually drop it even further to say 100 bucks for per genome and so on. And that's how we want to do it. Uh, so this concept came about from uh, David Brandon and uh, Dimer and uh, and George, so they uh, uh, filed a patent uh, sometimes early 90s with John Kasyanovich, of course, and uh, the patent was about using nanopores for DNA sequencing. So the idea is the following: we have a, a nanopore, and uh, I need to introduce what a nanopore is, but it's kind of easy to conceptualize. It's a nanometer-sized pore in a in a in a thin membrane, so in this case it's a, it's a membrane channel in a lipid bilayer, but you can also think about uh, just a hole in a silicon nitride membrane. And uh, so that uh, is placed in water compartment with ions dissolved. So it's typically one molar KCL, but so think about you just take a spoon of uh, salt and, and it's a very highly concentrated solution. So then you take uh, two electrodes put them on the other sides, uh, on the opposite sides of the membrane and apply electric bias. So when electric bias is applied, current will flow through the pore. Yeah, so it's just like electric measurement. The closest thing to nanopore sequencing is Coulter counter, if you're familiar with that technology. So basically you have a small hole in an electrolyte solution, you apply electric field, current will flow through the pore, but DNA is also charged, right? So DNA will also flow from one side of the compartment to the other, and there's only one way it can actually permeate through the membrane, that would be through the nanopore. And as it passes through, it will also block the current. So here's the ex actual experimental data. Uh, this is an open pore current, it's kind of noisy, but that's what it is, and then there's this spikes, right? If you zoom in into spikes, you'll see this nice blockade current. That's what's called blockade current. That's when DNA is in the pore. And I have a movie that illustrates uh, the actual translocation process. So, you know, DNA starts on one side, you apply electric field, and it wiggles in and exits on the other side. So this movie is not super realistic. It was done in 2003 just for uh, illustration purposes, but I like to show it. Uh, all right, that's the translocation. Now here's another image that shows how ionic current happens. So again, you're kind of looking at the zoom-in version of this channel. There's a DNA strand and those balls that move up and down. Those are ions, okay? And you can see that one color uh, spheres go up and the other color go down. That's because they are all opposite charge. So you have dissociated ions, potassium and chloride. And uh, yeah, so they produce the current. Uh, uh, are there any questions? Because it's kind of essential to the rest of my talk. No? 
Okay. All right, so that's the ionic current. As the idea was that maybe if we are uh, lucky or clever, maybe if we build this port, then we will actually, as we record the current, we'll see some variation in this blockade current, right? So this is experiment. There's some kind of a noise. But maybe if you have a better amplifier, better pour, better everything, if we zoom in, we'll see these discrete steps. And then just by measuring current, we can measure the DNA sequence. Yeah, so that's the essence of nanopore sequencing as it was proposed in 2000, I mean, in, in 90s. So direct electrical measure of DNA sequence. So think about it now coming back to the DNA uh, written, code written in atoms. Why would it work? The reason why would it work is that this pore is very narrow. So when you place the DNA nucleotides in there, you really don't have that much room for ions to move. So potentially, uh, the current of ions can be sensitive to the DNA atoms that are in the pore. Right? So that's why it would work. Although it remained uh, controversial and overpromised for quite a bit uh, of time. So the basic problem with this setup was that the DNA was moving too fast for the ions, I mean, compared to the motion of ions. So you didn't have enough statistics, you didn't have enough ions permeating per nucleotides to actually call the base. So that was a fundamental drawback of this system. But uh, another pore came along, it's called MSPA. It has a much better shape. It's like perfect for DNA sequencing. You have just a, a nanometer volume where you can find two or three nucleotides. And uh, another development was the use of an enzyme. In this case, it's DNA polymerase, but you can use uh, a different enzyme, helicase. And what it does, it comes and binds to the junction of a double-strand DNA and a single-strand DNA. And uh, in the synthesis mode, what the enzyme does, it pulls the DNA up. Because it wants to synthesize complementary DNA strands, so it pulls the DNA up. But electric field is applied like that. DNA is negatively charged for those of you who are physics uh, majors. So it actually pulls it down. So you have tug of war. Enzyme pulls it up and the field pulls it down. So, and that makes the motion of DNA much slower. So basically, the enzyme has to wait for a, for a nucleotide to come in, bind, and then it will just step it by one nucleotide. So suddenly, uh, instead of a microsecond uh, permeation, you have milliseconds. You know? And uh, again, the current is not shown, but there is a current flowing through it, and that's the actual recording from uh, Jens Gundlach at the University of Washington. So you can clearly see, uh, this is just not process data, raw data from experiment, you can clearly see the steps in the blockade current, which you can then interpret in terms of a sequence. Okay, so that was 2000. 12th paper, first paper that demonstrated feasibility of DNA sequencing with nanopores, and then they also published um, this is a much more developed paper, 2014, where they sequence viral genome because this is just was a designer sequence just to demonstrate proof of principle. In 2014, they sequence uh, like a, a genome from a from a bug. Yeah, so it looks like it's working. Okay. There is a company, Oxford Nanopore Technologies, they are commercializing uh, nanopore sequencing. Um, we don't know exactly what kind of enzymes they use. I mean, what kind of pores they use for DNA uh, recognition. They uh, use a helicase to arrest the motion. So it's basically very similar to what I described here. Although it's a company, you know, they engineered and optimized everything so they can make a product. Product looks like a USB stick. And uh, yeah, so it's kind of radical compared to a normal sequencing machine, which is basically like a fridge. This one is a portable, so you can take it in the field and so on. People have done it. People have taken this device and, uh, and look for bugs in the pound or in the air. Because you can just take a sample, you drop it. Well, this is not where the DNA is. It opens up and you drop it in and uh, 
and it's fully automatic. There's this nanofluidics, everything in there, and and then um, there are quite a few pores through which the DNA goes, and then uh, ionic current data are uploaded to a cloud, and then it's processed, and you get your sequence back. Yeah. So yeah. Well, it of course depends on on the lens, on on the lens of the DNA. So, typically, like this device is used for viruses, and for viruses, in it could be almost real time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it's not re really real time, but it could be a few hours. Yeah. So another thing. Um, so if it has multiple pores. Yes. How do you? Did you have? I mean, I'm assuming you have an algorithm that overlays them and everything, but how do you exactly know where, where it starts and where it So, for a single pore, let's first talk about the single pore. It's kind of straightforward. So, when you have a single pore and no DNA in it, you have one level of current, which you know already, because the all pores are the same. And once you see the current drop to a certain threshold, that means it, it it began, yeah, the sequencing began. When it comes back, it's done, right? So the beginning and the end are well defined. Now, how do you actually resolve different <coughs> steps? Well, if you see steps, then you see steps, right? Of course, there is a chance that you would miss some of the steps, or enzyme can also back step, so you'll have double steps, so that introduces errors. But that's something, you know, that, that, that people can deal with. Now the issue of multiple pore is a completely different story because with one pore you can kind of quickly calculate even if you can resolve it in one pass it still would take too long to sequence DNA. So you have to parallelize this in one way or another. And the way it's done right now with this device is that it has uh, like hundreds of independent wells, each of them electrically uh, uh, independent. So all of those uh, thousands of uh, well, hundreds of wells are um, electrically addressed uh, to measure the, the currents, right? So it's just sequencing in parallel. So eventually if this technology will, will go to human genome, it would have to be massively parallel, like millions of pores, because otherwise yeah, you know, it would take too long. So, so far it's been used for bacterial sequencing. Or you can also use it for short, short fragments of DNAs. So what's nice about nanopores technology is that it potentially doesn't have a limit for a read length. So in all of those, specifically in second generation sequencing, you, you do short DNA reads, like up to 100 bases. This one can go up to a million bases, and I think the longest one that people published was 200K, which is, which is, which is long, yeah. All right, so Okay, so basically that's where nanopore sequencing is right now with biological pores. I haven't yet told you what I'm doing. Uh, so we're trying to understand why it works because nobody knows. Yeah, okay. So I made it so simple that you know that the, the DNA blocks the current and then you get uh, a current blockade and it's true, it does, but we have no way of telling what the blockade is. So basically what experimentally happens, uh, people test all possible permutation of nucleotides. So typically you're looking at four at a time, so it's 240, no, yeah, it's 264. Sometimes it's five, so then you go to a thousand something, different combinations, uh, which you can calibrate by doing the following experiment. You attach a very bulky a protein to one end of the DNA, so in this case it's tryptavidin, and you just do your measurements as before, but eventually this protein will block the pore and it does not allow it to pass through, and you can kind of count and you calibrate the system so you actually know what's in the constriction. So that piece of the DNA is the same, but here you just switch it into like say all A's or ACGT uh, or something else, and you obtain a lookup table Okay, so sequencing is done by a lookup table. You then see, aha, this level corresponds to that current and so on. Because there's no way to predict what that current should be, or there was no way to predict what this current should be, 
And it's also kind of counterintuitive if you look at the actual blockades. So those are blockades for DNA made of entirely of C, T, A, or G nucleotides. So you'll find that the, the nucleotides that are bigger, that should block the current more, they actually block it less. So that's one thing. Second thing, if you actually know the blockades for A, C, G, and T, you won't be able to tell what the blockade for any combination of them will be, so they're not additive. Yeah, so there's, it's an interesting physics problem, and and that's why I'm working on it. Yes. Uh, yes. Well, no, so there, there are two things. First of all, the movie that I show is not real time. Yeah, the movie is not real time, but microdynamics captures the time scale of experiment uh, fairly accurately. So it, it, I think this movie was 100 nanoseconds. In, like, this movie shows what happens on a time scale of 100 nanoseconds, okay? And, um, and on a time scale of 100 nanoseconds, in experiment, you would observe this event happening also. So there's no really mismatch between microdynamics and uh, experimental time scale. Of course, it's much faster than the time scale at which I show it. Yeah, make sense? No. Yeah. Yeah. Exp yeah. So microdynamics gets it right, and, but it's usually limited to small time scales, like uh, several microseconds. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Yes. This non-additive part is that there's two nucleotides in That's right. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. So it's so that's 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 one of the questions that we set out to explore with our simulations, and uh, the answer is the short answer is it's actually just the narrow. There's a very this sensitive part in the channel that is half a nanometer that determines what the current is, but the DNA itself moves up and down by quite a bit, and that smears the signal by four nucleotides. Yeah. So the porous goods, the DNA is just too floppy. Okay. I'm going to show you a movie of that later on. All right. So those were the questions, and uh, let me briefly introduce the methods that we use: microdynamic simulation. It's a classical simulation, so every atom is a particle, and particles are connected to form chemical structures. It's a method that has been developed and calibrated over 30 years. It's a special. It's a field on its own development of the force field. So we're using supercomputers uh, like Blue Waters, the ones that we have here at the University of Illinois. Atom by atom we build microscopic models of the system, like in this case it's a silicon, uh, silicon nitride pore and DNA molecule and then we just uh, simulate it and we see how the process actually happens. Okay, So I'll be showing you images and movies from microdynamics and um, just keep in mind that in all of those we have every part of the system present like water, ions, everything is modeled explicitly and everything is moving so if in a movie or an image you see just you know some just a part clear view of a DNA that means that I removed everything else so you could see the DNA okay so with this method typically what can we do we can simulate uh, Systems that are up to uh, like 50 cubic nanometers, that would be an extreme case. And the time scale range from uh, yeah, nanoseconds to hundreds of microseconds. That's what typically can be done. Of course, doing 100 microseconds for 10 million atoms is extreme. Uh, but yeah, it's, there is usually a trade off between size and, and duration. All right, so how do we actually do it? Just a few slides. Uh, 
So I always say molecular dynamic simulation is like cooking, so you need to first find a recipe for what you're looking for. If I want to simulate alpha hemolysin, I would just go to protein data bank and uh, download the crystal structure of alpha hemolysin. Yeah, so here's the protein data bank. Uh, you type in hemolysin here, and that's what you get. And then you add things to it. I guess DNA is the most unconventional thing, but everything else you're familiar with cooking. You know, just add you know, some fat, salt, water, and, uh, and the next thing you turn the heat on, meaning every atom gets a kick and uh, corresponding to the distribution of velocities at 300K. And everything moves around. And surprisingly, this method is accurate for predicting ionic currents through nanopores. How do we know it? Well, we can do just apply electric field like this, which will uh, polarize the water, produce the distribution of ions in the system, and, uh, and we can see ions moving basically through the pore. Again, you know, here you're just looking at ions, but that's because I just made it so only ions are in the center of attention. Everything else is also moving, and you have water there. And once we know displacement of ions, we can easily compute the current, just the definition of the current, you know, from high school. And, uh, and if we do it at different voltages, we can compute current voltage dependence of an ion channel just directly from microdynamics. And that's something we did 10 years ago. And it was surprisingly accurate. I was actually shocked to see how accurate it was. Uh, First of all, we reproduce the asymmetric curve of hemolysin, but then also we also got the number, well, to 10% error, which is quite good for molecular dynamics. So perhaps that's why molecular dynamics is so useful for DNA sequencing, because um, you can compute the currents from a simulation and match them to experiment one to one. You know, also our time scale are different. You know, microsecond is not what the typical uh, time scale in the, in the lab is, but the currents that we get are right on. So if we are simulating representative state of the system, we are expected to get the numbers right. All right. So what happens with uh, Himmel? I mean, with uh, with MSPA, what determines the ionic current blockade there? So uh, to figure it out, we had to go to long simulations and use a special purpose uh, hardware at the show research. Uh, we also had to cut the system quite a bit to fit into that computer. Uh, so here's a simulation where we have two uh, representative trajectories. We have uh, one made of all T's and the other made of all A's. And you can see like what happens on a long time scale. Um, so the DNA is not like a rigid rod there sitting and, and blocking the current. It undergoes fairly complex uh, dance. Uh, it's a choreographic. It comes up, comes down. Uh, and accordingly, if you look at the current trace, you'll see that it kind of goes up and down. This up and down is not produced by uh, ions passing through the pore, not the short noise. It actually has to do with DNA changing the conformation. So it's time scale about 30 microsecond DNA just moves quite a bit on that time scale. And to figure out what is going on, we looked at the narrow constriction of the pore over here. And I'll just come to the conclusion of this part of the talk. Basically, what we found was that it's the number of water molecules that are in the constriction that determine the current. So if we plot here the ionic current, and the number of unstructured water molecules, you see they correlate extremely well. But the correlation is not linear, right? You can have things correlated, but it's not a linear correlation. Actually, the correlation is n, which is the number of water molecules to the power of uh, five thirds, approximately. And that would give rise to extreme sensitivity to the ionic current. So you change the volume accessible to water by a little bit, but you change the current by uh, a higher value because of the nonlinearity in between the two. All right. So that was a biological pores. So the rest of the talk will be focused on solid state pores. And why solid state pores? Why bother? That's a good question that you didn't ask. But I ask myself always, why? Why solid state pore? And the reason is that 
With biological pores, there is a limit how you can paralyze it. You know, imagine you have to make a device that has a thousand independent wells with lipid bilayer in it and a sensitive membrane channel and you make it in England and you ship it to Fiji, right? And it's expected to work and it works. This is amazing actually that people can do it. But now if you want to do it with a million pores, it's kind of difficult, you know. Lipids are not the most uh, easy material to work with. On the other hand, as you know, after 10 weeks, I mean, 10 days in here, you can do a lot better with the conventional fabrication technology, right? So billion elements on a chip, that's probably what state of the art is. We don't need a billion, we just need a million. So if you can make nanopores from solid state materials ideally compatible with uh, conventional fabricational technology, then it's, uh, it's a big deal. So solid state nanopores are no different from biological pores in the technology of how they're used for DNA sequencing. So you take a DNA molecule, apply voltage, it passes through. Again, you would measure blockades. And you can hope that maybe, maybe if you look closely at this, you will still see the differences in the ACGT, right? But you can kind of see that it's probably not going to happen for this pore. This pore is too thick and we have a double strand DNA passing through it. So what can we do? There are quite a few things that people have tried to do. I think this is the most amazing from all of them. This is a device concept from Japan which is based on a work that was done in Harvard and in uh, University of San Diego uh, by um, Golovchenko and uh, Max Deventra. So they, what they proposed is to use quantum tunneling, tunneling currents to sequence DNA. Okay? It was a fairly radical idea that you have two electrodes now instead of, and the DNA still passes like that, so instead of measuring ionic current, ionic current blockades, the idea was to measure transverse current of electrons. So you would have a gap here, electrode one, so the electron will have to hope to the base and then to the other electron through tunneling. And, uh, and that would be the signal, yeah? Science fiction. Uh, theory says that it can be done and recently experiments show that it can, can be done in practice as well. So there are two groups that reported it, one in Japan, one in ASU. Different approaches. There is a company called uh, Quantum Biosystems. Bio uh, here's a prototype, looks like a coffee machine. Uh, and uh, so apparently it works. Maybe. I, I, I cannot tell how well it works, but uh, the company is out there, they might have a product and so on. But that's not just the one. If you look at any major chip company, you know, Intel, IBM, Hitachi, Toshiba, Sony, Siemens, all of them have or had or will have at some point a nanopore sequencing project. Yeah? And why? The reason is very simple, you know, there's, okay, chips are great, but there is so much that you can do with it. Uh, they always wanted to do some applications in bio, but the scale of bio applications was so low tech for them that it was not feasible. You know, if all this microfluidics, that's kind of scale of devices they did in the 60s. This finally, you know, there is a, a, an application that would require precision in nanofabrication. You know, if we are going to make a, a chip that would have a million wells in it, each of the wells would be fabricated at the nanoscale, you know, and probably one of those companies will have a capacity to do it. Yeah, so that's why there's so much interest. There are also quite a few startups of different developments, so like Genia, Napsys, yeah, all of those companies have also nanopore development in, in, in works. All right, so first story will have to do with graphene. Uh, everybody knows how to get a Nobel Prize by now. I assume you already had some lectures on that. Right? Yes? Yes. Good. Okay, so, okay, can we use graphene to sequence DNA? So, idea is the same, is the same. Let's, let's just do the simplest thing. Let's just do the same thing, but with graphene now. Okay, single layer graphene, DNA passes through, we're reading the current. Again, this is a cartoon. Let's see what happens when we take a DNA and place it in a graphene nanopore. 
So again, this is the result of a simulation, and uh, what you can see is that if we start DNA extended, it will quickly collapse to the surface of graphene, and then it will not stop. It will continue permeating while performing this two-dimensional diffusion. So it's actually a very interesting system. Graphene is an infinitely smooth material, so there's basically no friction. Unless there is a defect, there should be no friction between something that is stuck to it something that is so uniform as DNA. So basically that's why it kind of moves around, but it also passes through the pore. Now if you look closely at what happens as it passes through the pore, you'll find something interesting. This is a movie. Yes. Okay. Let's try again. Yeah. So if you look closely, you'll find that this translocation is not with a uniform velocity. In fact, it is stepwise. If you plot here the number of nuclei that's permeated, we clearly see steps, yeah? Which is kind of a big deal because uh, for biological pore, we had to use an enzyme to step DNA in nucleotide at a time. Here, just the physics of the system is such that it produces stepwise motion. And uh, can actually someone tell me why it's stepwise here? Yeah. So there are several things that come together, but basically, first of all, graphene, people think about graphene as a, a super very good conductor, right, and so on. But that's in plane of the graphene, right? On top of it, it's kind of still hydrophobic because you don't have that many uh, electrons to, to polarize this way. So it's experimentally known that things stick to graphene as, as, as crazy. And DNA is not an exception. It will stick to the graphene hydrophobically. So the basis, you know, they will just lay on it. And then when you pull on the DNA, the base has to unbind and rebind on the other side. And that is a process that is activated. Yeah, so it, it, there's a certain probability for it happening. And when it happens, it translocates quickly. You know, and then it sits for the next one. That's why it's stepwise. So we uh, looked at uh, like what's the best uh, system to sequence DNA and people used to think that the single layer graphene is the optimal one because it's really thin so it can kind of pinpoint the sequence of DNA precisely. It turns out to be that's the worst case for sequencing because then you just uh, base is never in the pore yeah it just sticks to the top and uh, to above and below the the graphene, but it's never in the pore. It's much better to use something like three layers. We have also shown that if one can place the DNA in the same position as the graphene, one could actually read out the sequence. This is prediction, not yet realized in practice. As far as I know, there are some technical difficulties with doing experiments with graphene. Uh, the pores are more noisy than usual biological pores, so that's probably the most the, the killer. But there are technologies to uh, prevent, I mean, to reduce the noise, and maybe you know this will work eventually. So, so in fact, yeah, graphene. Maybe we can use graphene as a DNA sequencing device. How much time do I have? 10 minutes? Yeah. All right. Yes. 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 Right. Well, but so they just happen. I mean, you just make them two layers. You know, in exfoliation, you just remove layer by layer, and then eventually you end up with one or two or three. I mean, they would just be, I mean, it's some, you just make them like that. You don't need to, to or is it your question? 
No, but they will have some chemical bonds, like in graphite, you know, graphite has multiple layers, and you just, as you strip down the graphite, eventually it was two layers. Yeah? Sure. You said it's really important the, that the DNA is sticking to the crack in the um, due to its hydrophobicity. How big an issue is it that graphene usually has stuff stuck to it, making it hydrophilic? Yeah, that's a big issue, of course, yeah. So, if you can have only DNA stuck to graphene, then it's perfect, yeah. So, um, yeah, you do have lots of things stuck to graphene, that's true. Uh, but that's, a, you know, that's more of a perfecting technology than making a technology, right? Um, people have tried to coat graphene with something. You can design a coating that has aromatic groups that would just go and... And if you do it first, you know, then it kind of prevents it from happening. Um, I don't know if graphene is really hydrophilic. Uh, <laughs> no, but... No, stuff does stack to it. But uh, in case of DNA, what we found was that it still can move. And then, you know, if you have something else like a... a and usually in your sample you have some other stuff that can go and bind. And that is not translationally invariant, and that can actually sit there. Yeah. You also have defects in graphene, right? When you have defects, that's when it's all this motion kind of ends. All right, so since I don't have that much time, I'm going to skip a few slides here. Actually, let me show this one. So we were curious if we can regulate transport through graphene just by applying a potential to it, right? So for graphene, that's something that people try to do. Because it's a conductor, you can try doing other things. So the idea was that if we apply a negative bias to graphene, then be Self, you know, the repulsive interaction between DNA and graphene would make it come off, yeah? And then it would move through the pore, which is different than if we apply a positive bias here, which will tighten this electrostatic interaction and it will stay, stay put. So that was ideas. So we try to realize it in a simulation. So you're looking here at a at a DNA that is collapsing on a negative on a neutral graphene, and we are going to apply uh, a negative potential to it, seeing if it can actually unbind. And yes, it unbinds very reproducibly. So we can go back and forth a lot of time, and it just binds and binds. So we called it molecular gymnastics, yeah, because it just does it so repetitively. Now, interesting thing happens when we change the charge of the graphene to a positive one. So, again, look at the movie. So, here's a usual neutral graphene. Once we charge it positively, something interesting happens. The bases, they, uh, they tilt. You see, they all kind of collectively undergo this conformational transition. And if you think about it, it's kind of... And now it's obvious why it happens. Because in this system, they are oriented with their dipole moments so that they achieve the minimum of energy. But the dipole moment of each type of DNA nucleotide is different. That's why they all have a unique response to charging graphene. So in fact, if we do it for different DNA sequencing, we'll find that homopolymers of DNA, they all have unique response. So, for example, we can even tell the difference between methylated cytosines from cytosines just by the angle at which they tilt. Like A's and G's, they look completely different. We also discover this new conformation of G's. So G actually stand up. So the backbone now is on top and they kind of do this ballet. Uh, uh, that was completely surprising. We did not expect it. In retrospect, we could have, but uh, yeah. So that's basically why I think this microdynamics is still a discovery tool. Um, 
But the question is, can we still regulate the transport? So what we did, we applied the bias and just measured the translocation and to make the story short, actually our conclusion was completely opposite from what we initially thought. We found that if we charge it positively, it just makes it go. And if we charge the graphene negatively, it arrests its motion. So here's an illustration of our stop and go motion. You see there's a gradient of the electric field in, in patriotic colors. Of, so um, it wants to go down and when the graphene is charged positively it will. Uh, it will just take a little bit of time. But now we want to stop it by switching the charge of the graphene to a negative bias. And that's what happens here. Yeah, it basically gets spinned. Now we are about to run out of DNA, so what will happen, we will reverse the bias to move the DNA up. Yeah? But it's not going to go because it's pinned by the negative potential. Now we make it positive, it goes up, and then we can catch it again with switching it to a negative bias. Yeah, and it stays there, and we can do it all over again. You know, it's fairly, it's fairly reproducible. Uh, so that's why we call it a stop and go motion. So we did not change the bias, but by we did not change the driving field, but by biasing the graphene, we alter interactions between DNA and graphene, making regulating its motion. All right, very quickly. So there, there's a zoo of different ways of sequence DNA using graphene and other materials. Okay. Here's just one of them. So tunneling current I've already introduced, but with graphene, when it comes to graphene, you have a choice how to sequence DNA. For example, you can use this nanoribbon conductance. Yeah? That's just a small, thin ribbon with a hole in it, and the DNA would pass through it. Now, instead of tunneling here, you're actually measuring transverse current. Yeah? But the way current is uh, realized in graphene is that you have scattering from the edges of the ribbon. Now if you have a pore here, uh, you know, the, your charge carriers will scatter from the pore and the presence of DNA will affect how it scatters. Okay, so that's a completely different concept from, um, from tunneling current. So you're just measuring transverse conductance and it's different. Uh, so all of that is great uh, except there's one little problem. Single-strand DNA doesn't look like that. Yeah. So everything kind of relies on single-strand DNA being straight as a soldier. But it's not. This is how it looks like. It's a, it's a clump. So there are quite a few ways people try to do it. And uh, I think we discovered at least two ways how to stretch DNA in this system. The first one came from an idea that, that we studied for some other reasons. Basically, what we wanted to see was what is the effect of local heating on nanopore? How many of you are familiar with plasmonic heating? No. So basically, the idea is that if you have a little piece of metal of a certain size and a laser of a certain frequency, then you, when you eliminate your whole system with a laser beam, only that part of a system where you have a nanoparticle will rapidly heat to the point that it can melt. But if you place it in water, then it will just, uh, it will not melt, it will reach a steady state, will be just a local source of heating. So that's realizable fairly easily. So what we found surprisingly that if we uh, heat the nanopore locally, the DNA will stretch. Okay. And that is actually something that you, we did not expect because from a polymer physics, uh, we know that if you heat the rubber, you know, it compresses. So something was going on here, uh, also interesting from a physics point of view, and uh, it looks like we discovered a thermophoresis. Yeah? Yes? So how fast uh, or are you setting up the power or the power and how fast the DNA will heating? So we assume that the heating happens in a few nanoseconds. Yeah. How, uh, uh, how, far? how far does it go? So here's a, here's a typical uh, temperature profile. This is like middle of the membrane. And 
this is finite element simulation using COMSOL. What? So I think the middle is set to basically boiling point, and it drops off like very rapidly. So 30 nanometers away, you don't you don't you don't see it. So it's a local. You have very high thermal gradients there, and those thermal gradients produce thermophoretic force that stretches the DNA. No, we did not calculate the energy. So basically, in the simulation, what we did, we just set the temperature uh, of, a, of a nanoparticle to one point, and then we set the temperature far away to the other one, and we run it until we have an equilibrium temperature. And then the DNA was let go, and it just stretch. But if we switch it off, it compresses back. You know, it's, it just goes this back and forth. Yeah, it's reversible, and it's fairly fast. You know, so it's in 100 nanoseconds, it's done. Yeah. So I guess we were one of the first people to realize that thermophoresis may play a role in this nanoport business. Actually, we, I kind of didn't know about it or forgot. And we literally discovered it in our simulation. You know, we put these two regions of different temperatures, and we see things migrating to the cold region. And this was, of course, described 150 years ago. Uh, by this gentleman. Well, anyway, so basically with this heating we can stretch the DNA. So maybe we can realize something like that. So what's another way to stretch DNA? So basically, so that's how we see. The other way to stretch DNA is to take a membrane and cover it with graphene. So I already told you that uh, the DNA will stick to it hydrophobically, right? So what it will do, it will stick it on both sides and stretch the DNA. Yeah, so you have a hydrophobic sticking to one side and to the other side, and uh, and that will stretch it. Furthermore, if you look how it actually transports through the DNA, you'll see that it kind of lands at the same spots in the membrane. So its transport is still stepwise. Now we're talking about much wider. I mean much thicker membrane, but it still lands in a reproducible single nucleotide step. So if you would have an electrode somewhere here for tunneling current, you would basically be measuring different nucleotides reproducibly. So that's kind of a big deal. Okay, I will show you one more slide, and I'll be done. So we are working on yet another radical uh, sequencing approach, which we call the plasmonic nanopore sequencing. So what we have here is a plasmonic nanoplasmonic system. So typically two gold bow ties and a little pore in the middle. Okay, you would think this is impossible to make. No, it's very possible to make. If you have a good electron microscope and a good person, one can do it. And the idea is the following. So we again have an electrolyte solution, membrane, and the DNA passing through the pore electrophoretically. We also have a laser here that uh, uh, illuminates the system with a light of a certain frequency. So the frequency is such that the electrons in those two gold triangles will oscillate rapidly, creating a standing wave. So standing wave, basically, it will focus the laser beam to just a nanometer hot spot at the edge of the, of the triangles. So those highly inhomogeneous, high-intensity optical forces will apply and trap DNA directly from the solution. And switching the laser on and off would basically make the DNA moving in steps. We will also have here a Raman detector, which will measure uh, surface-enhanced Raman scattering from the part of the DNA confined to the hot spot. So there's, um, it's already known that different nucleotides have vastly different SERS signals. So this is ACGT, they, uh, their Raman shift is clearly separated. So you'll get some kind of a convoluted signal that then we'll have to deconvolute into the sequence as we do this kind of a measurement. So that's something that is still active field of research. Uh, if you want to know more, ask me about it. Uh, and I think that's where I will end. Let me just go to my acknowledgement slide. 
All right, so work in my group has been supported by NIH, this revolutionary genome sequencing technologies, and uh, I got also a career grant from NSF for that. Uh, Oxford Nanopore is one of the sponsors, uh, IBM at some point. Uh, we enjoy uh, generous support from various uh, allocation agencies at Blue Waters at UIC also, and TerraGrid, Exceed, and so on. And thank you very much for your attention. Yes. Um, so what exactly are you measuring in the, this transverse electronic measurement? measurement? So if it's a nano ribbon, you just measure conductance versus voltage. And some theoretical studies suggest that basically how conductance changes with voltage, that is a signature of different nucleotides, not just at a fixed voltage. What about each nucleotide changes the conductance in the nanorhythm? Yes. Sorry, what about the nucleotide concept? Is it just like a dipole moment? Yeah, it's electrostatic, basically. And all those calculations, I mean, th those are not my calculations. Let's start with that. And it's not in microdynamics. You actually have quantum transport stuff. There, the nucleotide is modeled as a, as a fixed dielectric, as a fixed dielectric object. Yeah. So it's its electrostatic presence. Yeah. Yeah. In which, in which um, case? Yeah. Well, for molecular dynamics, is really simple because we actually know the trajectory of each ion, mm -hmm. and uh, and we know its charge. So it's uh, you know displacement in a unit of time times charge is a definition of current. We just sum up over all of, all charged entities in the pore. And that gives us current directly. So it, we don't have to like solve for it. it it's, we just have to count how many ions pass, you know, roughly speaking. Yeah. For uh, uh, yeah, for something more complicated like this tunneling current and transverse current, you need to have something else, different physics approach to compute that. We can still use the conformations of the DNA and everything else to to do the calculation, but the actual calculation requires some other method if it's tunneling current. Yeah. Yeah. How do you form nanopores in a single membrane? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, there are quite a few ways to do it. Uh, the, um, the first that people tried was uh, ion beam. Ion beam milling, very big machine, high vacuum, expensive, not so good. Uh, the other thing, that which was one of the pioneers, was actually Greg Temp. He was here at uh, U of I at some point. And, uh, and that, based on artifacts that everybody knows in semiconductor industry, that if you crank up intensity of your electron beam while you image, you'll burn a hole. Turns out to be an amazing way to make pores. Yeah? So you just, uh, you need to have a really good microscope that can focus and high energy. And then if you remember and it's thin enough, in 20 minutes you burn a hole. And what's nice about it, you can actually see what you're doing because it's, you're still imaging, right? So once you have the pore of the right dimensions, you're done. There was yet another variation to it is that then you can also kind of anneal it and see it shrinking or growing so you can kind of fine tune it. But that's kind of for people who have electron microscope. There are some other methods recently that developed and which I think will be how people will make it eventually. So the best one is this dielectric breakdown method and that was from um, Vincent Trabarcosa from University of Ottawa. So what he did, he took a thin membrane, put the electrolyte and he did, okay, let's, let's apply 10 volt and see what happens. Yeah, and what happens at 10 volt eventually the membrane breaks down. Yeah, you have a dielectric breakdown. But if you actually monitor it carefully, you'll see that it starts from a single pore. So if you switch it off in time, you end up with one pore made 
biodielectric breakdown. And then, of course, you can optimize conditions. You know, we can ramp up the voltage. You can uh, uh, optimize pH of the electrolyte. So, at the end of the day, you have a reproducible uh, protocol to making pores of any dimensions without using any kind of microscope, which is which is cool. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I'm wondering with your uh, graphing core, when you have the voltage applied transversely, if anyone would that, if you have like a Hall uh, effect, like if you also apply a magnetic field and maybe the Hall shift would also change the magnetic field you do that in the core? Yeah, I don't know. I am not familiar, I'm, I, I'm not aware of any published work on that. Uh, I don't know how big of a whole effect. I mean, you have to have a small, like really small ribbon. So we're talking about tens of nanometers. I don't know if that will be a big enough of an effect to, to see. Is it? I mean, I'm not an expert on the whole effect, so. but I haven't heard of people doing it for for nano ribbons. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So anyone else? Uh, okay. Thank you, Alex.